Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. We're going to talk about that in a little bit about me. Um, in addition to the obviously the bio written by our marketing team, <laughs> um, I don't have any financial disclosures to uh, to discuss. I've been practicing gastroenterology for 24 years, 27 if you include the fellowship. Um, as she mentioned, I, I won't really go into any more of that because it's already been said. I do a consultative GI practice at, at Emerson Hospital in Concord. Um, I have some uh, information on my practice and, and my associates as well to uh, hand out if anybody is interested. This is my office team. They're the best in the business. They make me look good every day, and I'm really happy to have them. Um, the docs are on the bottom. That's me on the on your left, and Dr. Nayer, Dr. Freibush, Dr. Khan, and Dr. Ayala are all in the front row. And then again, that's my awesome team behind them. Again, March is National Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. This started in 2000. It's been, um, it's, this is a great month to, to talk about colorectal cancer awareness. It is a really um, huge problem in this country, and we're making great strides towards decreasing the incidence of colorectal cancer and catching it earlier, which will all be discussed um, coming up. Again, it's preventable, it's treatable, and it's beatable. Colon cancer is very treatable and um, and you can and survivable if it's caught in its early stages, less so in later stages. So the colon is uh, about four and a half to five feet long. It's about there in the body. It is a obviously a vital organ, although you can live without it. Um, colon cancer is quite common. We're going to talk about how common it is, what the scope of the issue is, um, the rationale for colon cancer screening, and why colon cancer is really an ideal model for colon for screening, and what are the options available for screening. Um, the lifetime incidence of colon cancer is about 1 in 23 for men and about 1 in 25 for women. 153,000 people will be diagnosed this year, and about 20,000 people under 50 will die of colorectal cancer this year. Um, that's something we're going to talk about a little bit more, too, the rising incidence of colorectal cancer in younger folks. Um, this graph just shows the how the incidence of colon cancer increases as we age. I don't have a, let me see if I have a, anybody have a laser pointer or some? There's I think I can use this. This shows how the incidence of colon cancer is increasing with age. Actually, this is not working. Um, and the average age of diagnosis of colon cancer is about 74. <clears throat> Um, I have a lot of other slides that are fairly busy, and I apologize for that um, in advance. And my slides are not advancing, speaking of advance. Okay. I may have to restart the program. My PowerPoint is not responding. Sorry about that. What would it be without some technical issues, right? <laughs> Not going to try to use that pointer anymore. Uh, so again, average risk of average age of diagnosis is seventy four. Um, this this slide is really important. It shows how since colon cancer widespread colon cancer screening has been implemented um, in the late nineties, early two thousands, the incidence of colon cancer has been on a decline. Um, on some of these slides, on the um, y axis, you're going to see um, different values, and that that will that will be uh, evident in a moment. So this just basically shows at the stage at which most colon cancer is diagnosed. And fortunately, most of it is diagnosed early, although not all. And um, distant just means that there's distant metastases. That would be stage four. Local just means early stage, like stage one or two cancer. Stage three is regional, if there's regional lymph nodes involved. That's all um, colon cancer. Uh, staging, which we're not going to get to spend a lot of time on, but just just touching on it. But this is um, again I mentioned before that the y-axis is different. So notice these these differences in the numbers. Um, colon cancer is not real common in young folks, but you can see basically this is just to show the trend is increasing in younger folks, less than fifty. So twenty to fifty, the incidence of colon cancer is increasing. But overall, it's decreasing, and that's, again, attributable to um, colorectal cancer screening. 
and again, this is showing the same thing, but this is actually showing that the most of the reason for colon cancer increase in the younger patients is related to disease of the rectum, rectal sigmoid and, and um, distal colon. So that's primarily what that increase is from. <clears throat> so this portion of the colon. Why is colon cancer increasing in young adults? This is kind of setting off a lot of alarms in uh, public health. And um, these, are, these are most of the reasons we think, although it's not really definitive, um, we're more younger folks tend to be more sedentary. We're drinking more. We're eating less healthy foods, more processed foods, and smoking. Um, so, what determines if somebody is average risk or high risk? So, there is no such thing as low risk for colon cancer. Um, patients will say when I'm talking to them about colon cancer screening, "Well, I don't need colon cancer screening. I I don't have any family members with colon cancer." but three quarters of colon cancers arise in the absence of a family history. So most of it is sporadic and that's, that's important. And that's not necessarily something that, that people, you know, uh, identify with. So what, uh, what determines high risk versus lower versus average risk? Well, if there's a personal or family history of colon cancer or advanced polyps, inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, um, there are certain genetic um, cancer syndromes, uh, HNPCC or Lynch syndrome, and familial adenomatous polyposis. Those are virtually 100% risk of colon cancer over a person's lifetime. And if there's been uh, abdominal or pelvic irradiation, those are all risk factors for an increased risk factors for colon cancer. Some of them are controllable and some of them are not. Um, we can't control our genetics. Um, we can't control if we have inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, we can't control our age and race, and those are relative risk factors. Uh, ca Caucasians uh, have a lower risk and better survival and better outcomes than African-Americans, and African-American males have the worst prognosis and the worst incidence of colon cancer. We can control our BMI through weight loss, healthy, healthy eating, smoking is obviously oh, those numbers. I'm sorry, let me back up. The numbers re uh, represent relative risk. So uh, if you have a family history of colon cancer or polyps, you have almost a two times greater risk of colon cancer than if you don't. If you have inflammatory bowel disease, you have almost a three, three times greater risk of colon cancer than if you don't. BMI is, is not as powerful, but it is important as is smoking and physical activity. So the lower, less, lower values less than one, are protective. So increasing physical activity can protect you from colon cancer. If you have five servings of red meat per week, you're increased by 1.13 uh, times. And vegetable consumption can be protective if you have five servings a day, which probably not a lot of us could do. <laughs> um, so what makes a test, um, what's a, what makes a test effective for colon cancer screening? And um, Things that are important for a test is if, is if it's affordable. Colon cancer screening, there's several options. We'll get to those in a moment, but the cost of a test to apply to a population, it has to be reasonable and has to have a benefit. So it has to save lives uh, or extend lives. It has to be relatively inexpensive and easy, and it has to be safe. Um, so minimal discomfort and uh, certainly not death from the test. The disease has to be worse than the test, right? Um, the test has to be accurate, so it has to have, has to when it's when there is a disease present, it has to be able to detect it, and then when there's not a disease present, it has to be able to not be positive. We don't want false positives, and we don't want false negatives. False positive tests can uh, subject patients to additional testing, which can also have harm and cost. And like I said before, it has to alter the natural history of the disease. Um, a lot of tests that are done for colon cancer screening are, are detection tests. So they detect the presence of colon cancer. Um, colonoscopy is any of the tests, the tests above like a FIT test, which stands for fecal immunochemical test, which looks for the presence of human hemoglobin in the stool uh, is an easy test to do. It doesn't require preparation, but, it, uh, and it's, but it's less sensitive, less specific than colonoscopy. Um, 
and the and Cologuard is the is the second one. That's a, a text test uh, for fecal immunochemical test plus uh, fecal DNA that's associated with colon cancer. And then virtual colonoscopy is basically a CT scan uh, with reconstructions and fly throughs of the colon. Um, so any of those options are detection tests. They don't prevent colon cancer. Um, colonoscopy can prevent colon cancer, and it only needs to be done once every 10 years if it's normal. Uh, current uh, colon cancer screening guidelines are that average risk Americans should be starting screening at 45 and continue to 75. Um, you can continue longer, especially if there's risk factors um, between the ages of 76 and 85. It's individualized based on overall health, expected longevity, other conditions, et cetera. Um, high risk colon cancer screening starts 10 years before the, the earliest or the youngest first degree relative who's diagnosed with colon cancer or advanced polyps. We're doing okay. We're not great. Our goal in colon cancer screening epidemiology is to get to 80%. We got a ways to go, but two thirds of people are being screened and Massachusetts is number four. I was really surprised that California was number 50, but everybody else falls in, in between us. But number four overall, and that's data as of last year. I'm sorry, 2022. Talked a little bit about stage. Um, stage is correlated with survival. Um, all the way to the far left is um, that small green thing represents a small polyp. That would be um, stage zero if it was if it was a cancer uh, carcinoma in situ. We don't use that terminology much anymore, but that would be what it would be. The second one from the left would be. Um, Still stage one, it's not involved, it's not through the muscularis stage two. Sorry, there's seven layers of the GI tract, and each one of these goes through more of the layers, has a more worse prognosis. These little these little things here are meant to represent uh, metastases or, or lymph nodes that have cancer in them. And next slide will show um, how addition, how first of all. This, this is the basis for Cologuard. Um, this is a little molecular biology for everyone, which is exactly what you want at <laughs> eight o'clock at night, right? So initial normal cells have um, some genetic abnormality called loss of APC, and that's one of the genes associated with colon cancer. Then another mutation occurs on top of that typically, and that's KRAS. Uh, KRAS is a uh, uh, kras kristen rat sarcoma oncogene. Not that anybody cares or needs to know that. Additional um, genetic abnormalities occur, and then finally, um, you, you develop cancer. This whole process takes place over five to 15 years. So that long lead-in phase between a polyp and cancer is one of the reasons that um, the colon, colon cancer is an ideal uh, model for, um, for cancer uh, screening. So I mentioned we would talk about some of the tests. Um, the FIT test, I mentioned that's the test that looks for human hemoglobin in stool. It's it's an easy test to do. It's inexpensive. It doesn't require a prep. That's the that's what's good about it. Um, but it's not real sensitive. It only picks up 74% of cancers. Um, it doesn't require a prep, and it has to be done annually for it to be effective. Um, it does not pick up polyps. So, you know, when we do colonoscopy, we find polyps that's how we prevent cancer. So it doesn't pick up polyps and some of the polyps are important. They can turn, if, if you're not getting this every year, you know, the goal of this test is early detection of cancer, but if you're not getting it every year, you could, um, you could miss the boat. Um, the Cologuard I mentioned before also, that's a non-invasive test. Again, it doesn't require a prep. Uh, it's pretty good for colon cancer, but again, that's cancer detection, not prevention. It picks up 40% of large lesions. It needs to be done every three years. It's optimally done every year, but insurance would not cover that. It costs about $600. It's not very specific. So there are some false positives with it. Colonoscopy is what everything else is compared to. It's the gold standard. Uh, and it can detect and colon cancer early and prevent it uh, by removing polyps. But it's invasive. It's not inexpensive. It's operator dependent. Um, it, and it requires a prep which is what most people feel 
is the worst part of the exam. I'm sure a lot of you already here have had colonoscopies and I think we can take what's sort of vote. The worst part is the prep. Anybody? <laughs> yeah, right. And I'm sure all of you all know somebody who has had colon cancer because it's so common. Um, again, other tests that are FDA approved uh, are a virtual colonoscopy, and that's that CT scan. Basically, they CT people supine and prone, and um, I should supine and prone, and uh, um, so that requires some radiation exposure. It is fairly sensitive for, for large lesions, uh, but it doesn't pick up small lesions and it doesn't prevent colon cancer. It's just, again, a detection test. A positive result would require a colonoscopy. Sigmoidoscopy used to be used a lot. It's used very little anymore. Um, essentially, you have the least experienced people like family practitioners, internal medicine docs, nothing wrong with that, but they're not experienced in procedures and they are doing the hardest part of colon. Uh, and it's um, it does require some prep, but not a full prep. It's also akin to if women were having mammographies on one breast every time instead of both breasts. It only looks at a third of the colon, so it doesn't miss it misses the proximal lesions. What about the um, the pill with the camera in it? I've seen more articles on that. Have you used it, or are you? No? We don't have it yet. It's not FDA approved, okay. uh, except in certain circumstances. I didn't include any slides on that because it wasn't FDA approved yet. But it is approved for patients who have not had a complete colonoscopy for whatever reason it couldn't be finished, um, and. Uh, I, or couldn't have sedation. Um, so it's it's very limited in, in its approval and it's not widely um, utilized in this area as far as I know. We don't we haven't used it. But it, it does show some promise and it is it can pick up lesions up to six millimeters with relatively good sensitivity. Um, this is a busy slide and I apologize for that, but it's got a lot of good information. This is the, this is the study that basically got Cologuard on the boards. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, the, the information is pretty good. I can't, so, um, so there were almost 10,000 patients who had colonoscopy, Cologuard, and the FIT test. Uh, and of those almost 10,000 patients, there were 65 uh, that had cancer. Uh, 60 of them were one stage one to three, and 104 had uh, any cancer or advanced adenomas, which were likely to turn to cancer in relatively short order. The um, FIT test of the 65, that picked up 60. So that's pretty good. That was 92% uh, sensitivity and the FIT test picked up 48. These are patients who already have cancer. Uh, patients who had advanced precancerous lesions, so these are lesions that likely would have turned to cancer. There were um, 757 of those. Cologuard only picked up 321 and FIT only picked up 180. So we're missing a lot of the, this is our opportunity to intervene and change people's lives. These are just regular polyps in this that are less than one centimeter, um, 2,900 polyps here. And this only picked up about 500 and this 220. So the sensitivity again, very low for, for polyps. And that's not what they're meant to do. They're meant to pick up cancers. Uh, also on this, this is showing, this would be like, uh, the false positive rate. So there's a there's some these are these are basically negative colonoscopies. This test was positive, so about a, a 10% false positive rate. So these patients are going to get additional testing, like a colonoscopy. And same here, these patients are going to get additional testing. So um, again, I, I I'm biased for colonoscopy because I think it is the best test and it can prevent cancer. But this kind of bears that out. But it does show that if you're doing, you know, something, uh, anything, it's better than nothing. Cologuard again, that's the test I mentioned that picks up a blood and fecal DNA in the stool. No prep required. Picks up um, large polyps, uh, 42%. Most of them are picked up by colonoscopy. Picks up cancer most of the time. And there's, but there are false positives and it's only for average risk patients. If you have a family, if you've got any of those risk factors that we showed before, Cologuard is not an option. It shouldn't be an option. It still gets used out there, um, but it's, it's not appropriate. So 
Anybody care to guess what the number one symptom of colon cancer is? None. Most patients with early stage colon cancer have no symptoms. Rectal bleeding can occur more in advanced stages. Uh, a change in bowel habits, particularly a change in stool, caliber, consistency, frequency, which could be a lot of benign causes as well, but can be colon cancer. Unexplained weight loss, uh, abdominal pain and bloating. Again, these are nonspecific symptoms. It could be attributed to a variety of different things. Uh, and then, of course, anemic symptoms related to anemia, symptomatic anemia, breathlessness, fatigue, um, decreased exercise tolerance. Talked a little bit about this before. So um, this is uh, the AJCC is the uh, American Joint Commission on Cancer. They determine a lot of the methodology and the and the parameters we use for colon cancer screening. I mentioned stage zero carcinoma in situ. That's normal survival. Stage one, uh, the the two numbers that are colon cancer and rectal cancer. So five year survival for stage one colon cancer is 92% and 88% for rectal cancer. For stage two, there's a range here because within stage two, there's stage 2A, stage 2B, um, and that's the survival for the um, for the other stages. Stage two is um, not in lymph nodes um, and stage four is with metastases, typically the liver. Again, I should have put that up better before, but this is the slide we saw before. I'm showing the different stages and how they how they uh, look. So if we were doing screening optimally, how many life years would we save per thousand patients? This is a study um, that that kind of that looked at that. It's 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 modeling. It's not it wasn't actually a you know randomized controlled trial. But if we're using a fit test annually. Uh, we would say 292 life years for that per thousand patients. If we're doing colonoscopy uh, every, um, sorry, this is really small. Colonoscopy every 10 years, we'd say 310 patients. So that's assuming um, that colonoscopy every 10 years occurs if there are no findings, if there's no polyps or cancer, obviously. So this this just shows that um, at that you know, a screening program, whether it's Cologuard, fit test, or colonoscopy, saves lives, lots of lives. And if we start it earlier at 45, we save even more lives. So that is the current recommendation, although the ACP came out and said, go back to 50 years of age, which none of us in the field could understand, but um, that's just one society. Um, so what can we do to decrease our risk? We can eat a, a healthy diet, a diet which is, we used to say, eat the rainbow, right? Every color, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, avoid processed foods, avoid salt cured foods. Alcohol in moderation, if at all, uh, stop smoking if you smoke. Exercise five out of seven days of the week, that's preferable, uh, and maintain a healthy weight. Low dose aspirin over long period of time, up to you need to take it for about 15 years to get a benefit but that can decrease rates of polyps and colon cancer and coffee. So coffee has been, we all, it's been vilified by so many people and so many societies, but actually there's a dose dependent effect of coffee on colon cancer re reduction risk. You have to drink at least two and a half cups a day, which is that's not, not a challenge. That's before you even get out of the house. Right? So again, I mentioned we want to get to 80%. That's our goal. And if we do that, um, we can, you know, I showed before, we save a lot of lives. Um, we can decrease um, colon cancer incidence by about 22% by 2030. We could decrease deaths by um, about 33% by 2030. And we could prevent or detect cancer sooner when it's easier to treat, more survivable. 88% uh, of adults diagnosed with colon cancer at an early stage live for five years or more. And it's, it's up to 92%. 16% when they're more advanced, uh, like stage four. We would reduce healthcare spending by one, four, about $14 billion by 2050 if we just got to 70%, and we're at like 65% in, the, in Massachusetts. So on the left is the scope, on the right is the processor. I know nobody really cares about that. That's what polyps look like, okay? 
Um, this would be that splenic flexure area, distal transverse colon, and there's a couple polyps. This polyp is on a stalk. We call that pedunculated, and that one's flat. We call that sessile. And that's what colon cancer can look like. It can look a lot worse, too. I got a couple slides that show somebody taking a polyp out. It's not me, not one of my patients. And if this loads, and it did not. Okay. This is a cold snare polypectomy. Oops, going back and forth. Um, so this, I'm not sure why it's not, it's not playing this. If you click on the video itself, no. Yeah, it's not playing. <laughs> well, this one might, no, it's neither one I'm going to play. I did load up to the internet too, so try one more time. Well, anyway, it was just a snare, a little wire with a loop that we extend out around the polyp. We tighten it, and if we apply, we either apply cautery, and that's a hot snare polypectomy, or we don't, and it's a cold snare polypectomy. The vast majority of polyps we take out nowadays are without heat, just just cold snare, basically a guillotine. Um, that's kind of a model of what we would do for a polyp. And that's that little loop that comes out of a working the working channel of this colonoscope, and we lasso it. Or Julie said we play. My wife in the audience says we're basically cowboys. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so take home messages for colon cancer screening: um, colon cancer is the second most cause of cancer death and the third most common cancer overall for men and women. It is a nearly ideal model for colon cancer for screening. Um, it is preventable disease by colon cancer screening and early stage colon cancer and polyps rarely cause symptoms. Um, colonoscopy safe and accurate and the prep has improved over the years. This is the prep that we generally use and it's pill based. So 12 pills, some water, wait five hours, repeat. And I'd say 95% of people are very well prepped with that. Um, the best colon the best colon cancer screening test is the one that gets done. So, you know, we I talk a lot about you know what I think is the best test, and if patients ask me, there it's it's a very easy to answer that question. But anything is better than nothing. If you do the fit test every year, it's going to pick up colon cancer early, hopefully most of the time, the vast majority of the time. Cologuard will as well, but you got to you know those ones require sequence. You have to do it every year or every three years in the case of Cologuard. Colonoscopy, if it's normal, it's every 10 years. So one test protects you for 10 years. Some people liken colonoscopy to um, a vaccine for your colon. Basically, you're protecting yourself against colon cancer with a procedure. Um, I have some additional tests on, on the mind gut. I don't know if I want to talk about that or we can do some question and answer um, now. Before we talk a little bit about my gut. Yes, sir. You talked about polyps and you talked about colon cancer. A um, couple of questions. Uh, what is the average person of, say, 50 years old, 55, 60 years old? What is the incidence of polyps, be they benign or be they whatever? Um, what is the incidence of that uh, for that, you know? Good question. Uh, Middle-aged group. Yeah. And, and, and second, I'll throw the second question. I just maybe put to me What is the chance of the polyps developing, and I presume rolling into colon cancer? Both great questions. So the first question is, um, what, is the, what is the incidence of polyps in patients with who are undergoing screening for average risk, average risk screening at say 50 or 45. And that depends. There is a true incidence, which nobody knows. And there is an incidence that we, that is based on our adenoma detection rate. So our, like I mentioned before, colonoscopy is somewhat operator dependent. It's very good. It's not perfect. We are probably missing some polyps. Um, the best way to know um, what your, and I, I, there are some additional slides I could put on here about the higher our adenoma detection rate is as a, as a colonoscopist, 
the higher our probability of, of detecting colon cancer, preventing colon cancer, and decreasing the rate of cancer that happens between colonoscopies, interval colon cancer. So to answer your question more straightforward, the, we find polyps in average risk colon cancer screening patients about a third to a half of the time. So between probably 35% and 50%, depending on the endoscopist. When you're searching for an endoscopist to do your colonoscopy, the first and most important question you can ask them is, what is your personal ADR, adenoma detection rate? They'll know it when you say ADR, and they'll also know, you you know what you're talking about, <laughs> all right? That might put some people on their back feet a little bit, but it's okay. It's an important variable. It's an important number. It's the most important number that, that you know, we can carry around with us. Um, we are... It, 20 years ago, the average uh, ADR was thought to be 20% for women and about 30% for men. So 30% of men having colon cancer screening should have, we should find polyps in them. So the adenoma detection rate is um, number of patients with an adenoma, which is the precancerous type polyp over total number of colonoscopies, right? Um, and, or total number of patients undergoing colonoscopy. And like that should be 35% for at least for men and not 20, not 30% anymore, probably closer to 40. So there's a lot of variation in that. Um, and that it's linked to how good the prep is, how long the colonoscopist takes to withdraw the scope. Generally what we do for colonoscopies, we go in, you know, straight ahead. We're, we're <laughs> going to get to the end and then we come out slowly. And we're looking mostly on the way out. But if we see polyp on the way in and we don't think we're going to be able to see it on the way out, we get it. So the ADR is very dependent on the operator, but it's it's a very important variable to know if, as a patient. The second part of your question was, uh, what percentage of polyps go into colon cancer? And that's that's a tough, that's an individualized patient question. There's not, we don't, we have, we don't, we can't tell because it's it's an unethical test. It's an unethical study for us to do to like leave a polyp in place and wait to, to turn to colon cancer, right? So we don't really know. We know that most polyps, not, not all polyps turn to cancer, but nearly all cancers arise from polyps. So the only way to prevent colon cancer is to remove the polyps. Now there are polyps that we see that there's no way that they're adenomas. They have a, a look, an appearance, a shape, a size, that is a polyp that does not need to be removed. And those are those are hyperplastic polyps. And they're small, they're round, they're pale, and they don't need to be removed. And we can leave those alone safely. But most other polyps we see we remove because that's how we prevent colon cancer. We can't tell by looking, oh, this polyp's gonna turn to cancer. If we have a very large polyp, that has that when we take it off has dysplasia or or is, is starting that pathway, maybe it's got a couple of those genetic mutations already. That polyp is likely well on its way, but we we don't make that determination at the time of the colonoscopy. We remove the polyp. We let the pathologist make that call, and then we we then we tailor our intervals for follow up based on the size, the number, and the type of polyps that, that patients have. Does that answer your question? I think so, yes. Any others? Uh, there's one online, and I you might have answered part of this, but um, can a CAT scan detect colon cancer in any way? And I think you answered that, but I'm wondering why you would choose that over a colonoscopy. So CT colography is virtual colonoscopy. There was a lot of excitement for this 25 years ago. It involves doing a CAT scan. You have to do a prep, so you don't, the worst part you still have to do. <laughs> and if you find something on a CT colography or a virtual colonoscopy, you need a colonoscopy. So you need to like go home and do another prep ever. So like you have to do the worst part twice. Um, so it is, it is available. It is FDA approved. It can, it needs to be done every five years if it's being done for screening. It's only for average risk people. And it involves uh, CAT scan supine supine and prone so you're getting double uh, c two two cts basically and there is you know there is a radiation exposure with that um so that's it's it's not the best test but it is an option and if you weren't going to have a colonoscopy under any circumstances and you couldn't be 
you know you didn't want sedation or whatever it's a it's an option and it's you know i wouldn't fault anybody for having something and if nothing was the alternative yes sir the, the lower intestine is four feet long four and a half five feet yeah you do a colonoscopy you're going in for what one foot no we're going all the way around all the way yeah so our scope is 200 centimeters or six feet long basically we don't we use as much of it as we need sometimes we feel like we could use a little bit more but um it, we uh yeah we go all the way around the, the whole colon do polyps uh when they occur do they occur in any part of the intestine predominantly any part anywhere? anywhere from the from the rectum I put my my uh diagram back up the whole colon can anywhere in the colon you can have a polyp yes sir you, you said that the, there's seven layers in the colon. Could you just describe what the tissue structure is a little bit? I mean, in terms of, is it like skin? Is it? So um, the innermost layer is epithelium. That is. Um, and the innermost being the closest to the cavity. I mean, correct. The correct. Part. To the lumen. Yeah. Yep. Um, so that's a skin like structure. Um, there's the same nerve endings that are on your skin are not in the colon. Um, so if somebody were awake, we can do biopsies, we can take polyps off, they don't feel it. Um, the next layer is lamina propria. It's just a fibrous layer. Below that is the sub submucosa, and then muscularis, and then there's a layer between that and what's called the serosa. And the serosa is kind of like the sac that surrounds, kind of envelops the whole GI tract, except the esophagus. The esophagus doesn't have serosa. But the, um, so those, those layers, I mean, I could probably get you a slide if you want to see this, the histology of it, but it's... Um, and does the cancers, do the polyps sort of, are they more likely kind of embedded in the epithelial layer or I mean, they, are they always growing that way? Or they, is it... Yeah, so they start, there are other lesions that can develop in other layers. Um, so the gut has a, its own nervous system. Um, it's called the enteric nervous system. And within that, there are certain cells in the enteric nervous system um, that can that can turn into cancer. Um, carcinoids and carcinoid tumors. Are you a, you a urologist? Yeah. So you probably know some of the some of this, all this is ringing a bell to you too, I'm sure. So the, the layers, the different layers, um, different kinds of cells can develop in the different layers. But the polyps that we're talking about all arise in the epithelial layer and the innermost layer. And um, they can, if they get, if they turn into cancer, they can invade through the other layers. And what's the uh, internal diameter of the large colon? I mean, is it? So it depends on if it's distended or not. And if it's just um, without any, well, we put CO2 in to open it up. Um, so we can see, and with with the CO two and a fully, um, every, you know, there's some variation in this. It's probably about five centimeters, five to six centimeters across. Um, so five or six centimeters across, like a the diameter turn, uh, across the diameter. Yeah. not not of the all those tissues, but just no, no, the, the tissues are are right. like probably the, the a, very, very a millimeter, tiny. right? Yeah, for all layers, and then as we distend the colon. Those those layers get even thinner, like yeah. a balloon, if you were, or a bladder, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. A question from someone: Is there any risk for an older person, like an eighty-year-old, to have a colonoscopy? So, yes, <laughs> there's risk for everybody undergoing colonoscopy, even young, healthy people. Colon, um, we the quote the rate of serious complications, which are bleeding, infection, <laughs> perforation, at about one in a thousand. So the rate is overall low. Colon cancer screening um, has the lowest rate of complications because we're not going in there in an emergency situation for a bleed or something like that. So it's a much lower, um, it's a much safer event. And we're not, you know, this is to prevent disease and not cause disease. So we, we it, the rate is you know, older folks have high, potentially higher rates of complications that are also not related to the procedure or are related to the procedure, but not directly, for instance, cardio, like arrhythmias or respiratory depression or things like that. It's really, 
you need a dedicated team that takes the most important thing, which is safety, importantly, and treats it with, you know, the important, with the um, seriousness that it deserves. So we don't take, we don't do this procedure um, on anybody lightly. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, and obviously we're, we, anybody who's doing this procedure should be very cautious and, um, you know, not try to like, uh, there are complications, but we, we try to, we try our best to minimize any risks, but it's not without complication. Yes, sir. Is there a DNA test that can be done to like, either predicts or detects cancer in a bulb? Uh, so the first thing that the pathologists do with the polyps is they just look at their structure under the microscope. And if there's cancer, they can detect it um, just based on the, how atypical. Uh, boy, if I had known we had such a good question, I would have brought some additional slides up here. Um, just how atypical the cells look. Um, so, you know, there's there's the main kinds of precancerous polyps are tubular adenomas, tubular villus adenomas, and villus adenomas. And those are increasingly atypical. And within each one of those, there is additional dysplasia. So there can be high grade or low grade dysplasia, dysplasia. And all of those are just basically how abnormal the cells look. If there's cancer, they can see cancer. And if there's cancer, they generally do additional genetic tests on the tumor, which can have implications with term in terms of what chemotherapies are used or what are the prognosis of the tumor. They can tell us if it's well differentiated or poorly differentiated. So there are, um, they do do testing. They look for um, mismatch repair genes. They look for Lynch syndrome genes. They look for all sorts of different genes um, that can be associated with colon cancer. And that has implications for, um, you know, descendants or uh, first degree relatives of that person. Um, when we see a cancer that is, um, has a genetic basis, which most of them don't, but when we see that, you know, we can counsel that patient to have their family member screened at an earlier age, which we would do anyway, but also potentially have them tested for for the for germline mutations or or, or cancers that hered are hereditable. Do these cancers metastasize? If it's left alone long enough, any you know any cancer will eventually metastasize if it's left alone. Yeah. Another question. Does the number of polyps discovered during the colonoscopy have any indication of cancer risk? Yes. Yeah. So the, if somebody, if a 50-year-old has one or two small adenomas, um, we generally recommend they get repeated. The newer guidelines say it's seven to 10 years. Um, I had a 31-year-old woman who had a five-centimeter rectal mass, about 31, five-centimeter rectal mass. It had... Uh, it wasn't quite cancer, but it was a half a step from cancer. Mm -hmm. So obviously she's going to have much closer surveillance. She's going to have much higher lifetime risk of colon cancer. Um, so yes, number of polyps. And if, there, if people have greater than 10 polyps at one time or, or ever in the course of their life, we recommend genetic testing and a repeat colonoscopy in one year. A good question. Can you just briefly talk about the genetic, um, so I have checked too, like the genetic testing. I think people have heard of BRCA for breast cancer, mm -hmm. but they don't know about these other mutations for other cancers as much. So there are literally thousands of <laughs> genetic mutations that are associated with colon cancers, different types, uh, not for colon cancer, but cancers in general. Um, check two is, um, that one's associated with like six or seven different types of cancer. Um, so that just means increased screening mm -hmm. and surveillance. Um, but what would bring someone to get that testing done? So a family history, right? Uh, certain especially if there's multiple, if you have like multiple first degree family members, like your mother had breast cancer, your father had prostate cancer, your sister had uterine cancer. Well, there's, there's a cluster and that's, that's right for testing. Um, that would be, uh, you know, we look for, um, we talked a little bit about HNPCC or, or Lynch syndrome. And that's um, 
three cancers in two um, two generations with one person less than 50. So younger patients with cancers or clustering is again, that's where we kind of, that's where the, the, the lights go off and we should be thinking about testing. Thank you. Uh, a question online, can pneumatosis be indicative of colon cancer? Oh, that's a good one. So <laughs> pneumatosis, can, there's two variants of pneumatosis. So there's a benign, no big deal variant. And there's a variant that is potentially associated with a very, with very serious infection or a serious uh, loss of vascularity to the colon. So the benign type is just that. It's benign. It's, it happens. It's, they're like little air blebs that happen on the lining of the, uh, lining of the colon. They're not in communication with the lumina or the tube of the colon. They're on the outside. Um, it is, um, if somebody has a CT scan, for instance, for something else and it's seen, it's, it's likely to be that benign variety. I've got a consult on this a week or two ago. Um, again, little air pockets. And is that, oh gosh, it's, air doesn't belong there. What is this, right? And again, it's either the benign type which no treatment is required, no treatment's necessary, though they do just fine, there's no issues. The more serious type though, I mean, that's, that's um, those patients are sick. They got that CAT scan because there's something going on in their abdomen. They're having pain, their the blood supply to their gut has been cut off and temporarily or, or indefinitely. And um, that's, a, that's a different, that's a different animal. Those patients are likely either going to succumb or get to surgery. So I'm presuming he's talking about the benign type and there is no correlation between pneumatosis and colon polyps or cancer in that variety. I hope that answered it. <laughs> I have a couple more questions that are going right. away from colon cancer. So I don't know if anyone has any more colon cancer questions. Um, a couple of questions about diverticulum. Okay. If a diverticulum is detected, how do you typically treat it? Another person asked, can you talk about whether it's safe to test or treat or remove them? Mm. Can't remove them. There's no treatment. The only thing we recommend is high fiber diet because we can't really, once diverticular are present and they're very common, 60% of 60 year olds and 80% of 80 year olds are um, have diverticulosis in this country. Um, it's so not you known. Can describe what di diverticulosis sure. is. Yeah. There are outpouchings in the wall of the colon that are in communication with the loop. Um, it used to be said that, oh, you can't have seeds, you can't have nuts. That's not true. You can. Um, it's not seeds or nuts that get caught in diverticuli that cause diverticulitis. It's stool. And we think that keeping the stool firmish and consistent is gonna cause less likelihood of the stool to get impacted in diverticulum. That impaction of the stool gets infected, that's diverticulitis, right? So 90% of people with diverticulosis, again, 80% of people who are 80 have a diverticulosis and 60% of people who are 60 have diverticulosis. I've seen diverticulitis in 20 year olds, so it happens. 90% um, of people who have diverticulosis never have a problem. 10% of people who have diverticulosis have a problem. That's split right down the middle between diverticular bleeding and diverticulitis. Um, diverticular bleeding occurs when one of those diverticuli erode into a blood vessel. It's in direct communication with the colon. Blood goes in the diverticulum into the colon lumen, and people have painless, acute, large volume rectal bleeding. Typically, it stops all by itself within a day or two. Um, sometimes they need transfusions, oftentimes they don't, but it typically occurs um, if we see, you know, a 75-year-old woman with known history of diverticulosis and comes in with painless rectal bleeding, it's 90% of the time it's a diverticular bleed. Diverticulitis is, like I mentioned, an infection of one of those diverticuli. We Sometimes we treat that with antibiotics. We're trying to move away from that because it doesn't often... It doesn't always, people who, everybody who has diverticulitis doesn't need a course of antibiotics. That used to be the way it was, but it's, it's, that's a bit of a paradigm shift in the way we manage diverticular or diverticulitis about 10 years ago. Um, and it is, there's no way to, you can't remove them. Um, you can't, 
treat them if, with other than high fiber diet. If you have complicated diverticulitis, which is a diverticulum that perforates, causes an abscess in the abdomen, they can be drained, treated with antibiotics, and eventually that segment where the diverticuli are, which is mostly on the left side of the colon, can be resected. Um, but surgery is really the only definitive treatment for removing diverticulosis, but it's not done often anymore. It used to be done quite a bit more. One more question. Um, is it possible to come off a protein pump inhibitor after long-term use of years? Many people have acid rebound and haven't been able to come off. Yeah. So that, so PPIs are very effective acid blocking medications we use for reflux and peptic ulcer disease. Um, the phenomena that person's mentioning is rebound hyperacidity. So I can get into, I don't know how much, how scientific you want me to get here, but uh, basically when you stop a proton pump inhibitor um, in, the, in the days to weeks that follow, there's an increased uh, tendency for the stomach to make acid. And that can sometimes get people right back on their medications. Um, so I would say the first answer to that question is depends on why you were on proton pump inhibitors. A lot of people get put on PPI is probably not necessarily. Everybody who burps or everybody who has a little upset stomach should not be on these medications. They're very powerful. They have side effects. Um, they're very effective, um, which is why they're so overprescribed. They're probably, they are some of the most prescribed medications that we have in this country, but somewhat overutilized. We want to use... Um, medications like proton pump inhibitors in the minimal effective dose, the minimal dose that gets the job done and no more. And it's, it's a challenge sometimes to find that minimal effective dose. But once we do, you know, if the patients who truly need to be on it, patients with Barrett's esophagus, for instance, or really bad reflux, that's not controlled with any other treatment, um, uh, condition called Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, where they make excessive acid. So those kinds of patients are going to be stuck on PPIs. But most other patients who don't have those conditions can try to wean off. The way I do it is I will have them go from taking it. Some people are taking it twice a day. First thing, take it once a day. If you're still doing well, take it every other day. But on the off day, use a Pepsid or an other kind of a lower mm -hmm. class of acid blocking medication. So you're, you're, you're kind of like tapering down and hopefully you're avoiding that rebound hyperacidity. And then maybe you go every two days, you know, you take a, take a pyrosec on Monday, you take it again on Thursday. And in those two days in between, you take a, a famotidine or a pepsin. So kind of just, again, weaning over time. And it might take a month, to get them off the proton pump and but it can be done. And, you know, there are some issues with long-term PPI use. People can get anemic, they can get low calcium, low, they can get low bone mass or osteoporosis, osteopenia, they can get magnesium deficiencies. There's a lot of issues and there's other conditions like um, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth that can occur with long-term PPI use. There's a lot of, a lot of um, adverse events. And like I say, they're very over overutilized. Thank you. I have a question. Yes, sir. Well, you mentioned AFib. I think you did with regard to it as a problem when you're doing colonoscopies. Could you elaborate? Um, so I think I said an arrhythmia. Yeah, AFib is an arrhythmia. And AFib is very common. It's not a problem for colonoscopy. We do patients with AFib all the time. Um, if they have atrial fibrillation that occurs during the procedure, then that's a little that's a little more complicated. We we might want to, we will we'll work that up, especially if they've never had it before. Those patients are going to get a cardiology consultation. We're going to do an EKG. Doesn't mean they can't go home the same day, but they're they're going to be some follow up for those patients. Um, we will do the atrial fibrillation needs to be rate controlled. So if they're if you have atrial fibrillation, but your rate is very fast, we wouldn't do a colonoscopy on a patient like that unless it were an emergency. So yeah, we see a lot of atrial fibrillation and it is, it's just another factor. 
It's not, it does not contraindicate a colonoscopy. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. <laughs>